so hello and thank you again. And um, as is pretty obvious, I'm, I'm super excited and, and very happy to be here in person um, after a long, long time. Um, and I want to thank everyone again and thank the, the speakers for um, two days of really thought-provoking um, presentations and discussing discussions. Um, I, I know I've been starving for this for a long while. So, um, let me start by introducing the RIT Cary Graphic Arts Collection in Rochester, uh, New York. It was founded in 1969, um, and it is one of the world's premier libraries on graphic communication history and practices. Our rare library holds over 45,000 volumes um, and over 130 archival collections that span all the way from cuneiform clay tablet, scrolls, medieval manuscripts, various printing technologies, and tens of thousands of type specimens that we continuously upload uh, to our digital collection. So basically, this is heaven for um, anything that is letter-related. We also hold a technology collection that focuses on preserving um, the heritage of letterpress printing. We maintain working printing presses and all the additional equipment that is needed for printing. And this historic collection is very much alive and it is being preserved through its active use in a wide range of activities like classes and workshops, special events, um, visits from fellows and scholars and artists in residence. And the typeface collection includes thousands of metal and wood type, the majority of which are American made, and up until 2014, um, all of which were exclusively of Latin characters. In an effort to expand the collection's coverage of global scripts, the Cary acquired an important and rare collection of about 40 fonts of Hebrew wood type. And acquiring this uh, collection was the beginning of a very long process of converting the letters into archival objects that are accessible for printing, teaching, research. The first step was to carefully clean and restore um, those um, blocks that set you know, and collected dust for many years. And this was, done, uh, this was made possible by the Adopt a Font volunteer program that was initiated by um, our associate curator and master printer, Amelia Fontenelle. So you see here the volunteers um, cleaning and sorting out the blocks um, according to their sizes. They did not uh, know Hebrew. They were not familiar with the script. Uh, so they got a... Um, um, a two-in-one uh, experience, both learning about letter uh, press printing and both um, and getting familiarized with the Hebrew script. And once the type was cleaned, it was time to look very closely at the design of the letters and identify each of the style variations. So we can then typeset each different uh, font for proof printing. And um, I started doing this just as COVID-19 hit. So, as uh, you can see here, I'm at home and I'm actually setting the type in galleys in the living room and spacing them with corrugated uh, cardboard. So, not ideal, but you have to do what you have to do. Um, when we were able to come back to our press room um, and with um, the help of a grant that we received from um, uh, the Rochester um, Foundation, we were able to add our student uh, employee employee, sorry, Kat Ward to our team. And here you can see her um, typesetting and proofing one of those uh, sets of letters. So after about 70 print runs, just like the one you saw here, the entire collection is now processed and catalogued according to a schema that I had to modify um, for it to describe Hebrew type. So it's fully accessible. It's all online on our uh, digital collection. And these are all uh, PDF files that you can uh, download and, um, and use for yourself. Um, there's also a finding aid, aid with all the information. So you're able uh, to learn more about the, the collection and how it was processed. So um, at this point that I had a clearer understanding of what this collection holds, I started focusing on my research. 
And I began asking the very basic questions, like where did the typefaces come from? What is the provenance of this very special collection? What was printed with these typefaces? And in what language? Was it Hebrew? Was it Yiddish? Was it both? And how did printers use them? What challenges did they meet? And how did they solve printing problems? And I think I can divide my research into these four sections. Looking into printing history to learn what was available at the time. Examining the physical blocks to see what their condition can tell us. Typesetting and printing myself to get that ink on my fingers and carefully go through this long and slow process to fully understand it. And analyzing and printing, um, sorry, analyzing the printing proofs from our collection and comparing it with other printed items. And this was not a linear process at all. I still um, find myself going through these stages and back and forth and around every time uh, I learn something new or I find out um, additional sources. So a lot of circles are, are being made in my brain. Um, let's talk a little bit about the evidence uh, that I, that I um, was able to work with. So the height to paper of each block is crucial in letterpress printing. All the components have to be made up to the same height, otherwise they won't print um, or damage the equipment. Since, uh, and those heights differ from place to place. Since our, um, all of the blocks in our collections are in the American size of 0.9 one eight inches, it is probably safe to assume that they are all American made from the 19th century, specifically from, 18, from the 1830s to the 1970s. The height of the letters can tell us what kind of printing they were used for. So as you can see, these are very large letters. They were used to print broadsides and newspaper headlines, so display text. Um, and these sizes, when we see the printing examples, we know that they were usually not cast out of metal, but made out of wood, um, for mainly two reasons. First of all, these are very large objects. It's very heavy to cast it out of metal. And the second reason is that when you cast large um, metal type, once the metal um, cools down, the surface usually um, cracks or um, uh, develops an uneven surface, so you basically can't uh, print with it. So, sizes for wood type. Another evidence I looked for, but uh, could not see anywhere, was a manufacturer mark. So here are some examples of such marks. Um, and wood type manufacturers use this to identify themselves as the original maker and to distinguish their products from those of their um, competitors. After a set would be produced, they would manually strike a steel punch to the side of one wooden uh, type block, usually in Latin for the letter A. And trust me, I looked at every Aleph, which is the first letter of the alphabet uh, for Hebrew. We could not find um, any, um, any such proof of where those types were manufactured. So the next step was to look at existing printed material and specifically typeface specimen. Um, and I have to thank um, many colleagues that helped me to collect this because these are very hard to find. Um, and I just uh, collected everything that I could find and I started comparing it with our uh, printing proofs. And I very quickly learned that this um, process um, was not ideal. The specimens show random letters not the entire Hebrew alphabet. Um, sometimes I had uh, photos of uh, pages from specimens, so it's not, it was never a um, flat scan, so I had some distortions in the resources that I was comparing the, the letters to. Um, and then, of course, there are the so many variables that has to do with different, um, the different printing um, itself, so different presses, different papers, different inks, different letter sizes, and, and so on. So I looked at these um, very consciously, knowing that this is not, you know, 100%. Uh, 
But I think that um, I was able to identify some design features that are very distinct. And once I was able to, to see that, I, um, I, I felt more comfortable that this is a match. So uh, we're looking at the f one of the examples. Um, we see uh, on the left the letters shown in um, Tab's um, 1909 specimen, and on the right is how I recreated it with our type. And here are some more examples from Empire Wood Type and Co. Uh, around 1926, Eastern Brass and Wood Type um, around the 1920s, and Hamilton Wood Type um, from uh, 56, uh, sorry, 55 or 60 specimen book. So, um, eventually I was able to identify three main style variations, which is three more that I uh, anticipated. This was, um, it was very exciting to actually go into the detail and see that we have um, distinct different um, styles. But they are all based on the Hebrew merubah, formal hand. So, their main classification is the same. Um, I named the variations after design features that could be seen across um, all the typefaces. So this is um, the, uh, the example for the variations. And I was also able to find um, three widths. So the regular, the condensed, and the very, uh, very um, cringeworthy extra condensed. Um, some facts about American wood type um, from the 1830 to 1970s that helped me to kind of um, locate myself and uh, the blocks. So we know that historically wood uh, has been used for letter forms and illustrations dating back to the first known Chinese woodblock print from 868 CE. Later on in Europe, large letters uh, for, printer, for printing were carved out of wood. And in America, the process of producing wood type was industrialized to support commercial printing of the 19th century. Darius Wells from New York invented the means of mass produ producing letters in 1827 and published the first known wood type catalog a year after. So we're familiar with this, um, with this time of explosion in Latin display uh, wood typeface for, uh, for advertising. These are examples for theater plays in New York City. And we can see the, the really uh, richness of the um, display typefaces. <coughs> And here I'm asking, what about the Hebrew and the Yiddish posters? So it's important for me to say that the provenance of our collection is still very much obscure, um, as I've kind of shared the challenges of actually proving it. So uh, I can't link the collection to a specific printer, but I would like to have a look at some printing um, examples that were printed with the same style of typefaces in the same time. Um, in the area of uh, New York. So here is an example of two bilingual um, posters printed in the Felshine Press in Brooklyn. Um, on the left, we see um, a Purim festival um, poster, and on the right is a one for a Slichot communal prayer. Let's look at the English typefaces. So the Purim festival, um, can be uh, described as similar to Halloween, Easter, and Mardi Gras all mixed into one. I think that's my fav favorite uh, description that I could find so far. So um, a very happy uh, event, right? A big festival, a celebration. On the other hand, slichot um, are communal prayers for divine forgiveness, and they're said during the high holiday season um, or on fast days of atonement like Yom Kippur. Again, a very specific um, type of practice. And we can see that in the English, the printer was able to express the nature of these two very different uh, events using different typefaces that felt more appropriate um, for the events. But for the Hebrew, he did, he did not have many typographic options. So we see here um, the use of the exact same typeface um, for those to very different events. And I'm going to try very, very briefly to explain why. And for that, I'll quickly describe the um, um, process of the development of the Hebrew language and um, how it uh, shifted into print. 
So Hebrew was the language of the Israelites and Judean people. And for over 13, um, um, sorry, 1300 years, um, it, it, um, around 200 BCE, it died as a spoken language and it was restricted only to religious practice. It was only reintroduced as a spoken language around the 1880s. So this is a very long period of time where Hebrew is only read and copied. It is not being used as a mundane secular uh, language. The biblical scribes uh, who copied religious texts could not uh, change the shapes of the letters. They were considered holy. And they did that at the cost of poor readability. The shapes of the letter forms were fixed and they did not undergo this natural evolution that a secular uh, script and language would. And so the transition from written form to movable type was very problematic. Um, punch cutters had no clear model of Hebrew letters. And again, most of them did not um, know the script of the language. We're aware of this phenomena. Um, so they copied existing shapes from existing manuscripts, usually of poor readability, uh, without really knowing or understanding or being sensitive to the nuances of the Hebrew language and script. And there was a period of this uh, typograph typographic development around the um, 15th century in Europe, and we are able to see some very um, impressive um, printing, but that period was relatively brief uh, since the Jewish people suffered persecution and were often forced to flee and relocate their presses. So through history, we have this prevention of, um, of continuity, um, of this natural development that is really needed for the refinement and development of type. And one example of that process is the um, shortage of styles of Hebrew typefaces. So we can see here, and this is until the 20th century, um, we have predominantly one style. Um, typefaces were manufactured in various foundries, mostly in, in Europe, and used the same Meruba style uh, with different design variations. <coughs> Meruba means square in Hebrew. Um, and um, this is referencing the shape of the Hebrew formal writing style. So imagine this typographic harsh reality. We have one style to rule them all, across all printed formats for very different uses. If it's textbooks uh, um, that require small um, type for continuous um, reading and typographic differentiation, whether it's newspapers that demand narrower letters in order to fit more text in a one sheet, or a broadside that call for large and expressive display letters. All the variations were heavily based on this Meruba style, and um, in some cases, they were created again by people who were not familiar with the script. So this is very noticeable. Printing uh, Hebrew in America. Um, this is uh, the book co that called Bay Psalm book. It is considered to be the first book printed in colonial America in 1640. And this book includes a preface on Hebrew poetry and language written by the clergyman and theologian Richard Mather. And in it, he included some Hebrew words. The printer, Stephen Day, did not uh, have Hebrew fonts. He had to carve the letters from wood himself. So. I, I kind of enjoyed the thought that the, the first Hebrew that was printed in, in America was wood type. And I think that even without uh, being able to read Hebrew, you can see um, in comparison with the Latin how the letters are inconsistent and clumsy, uh, significantly bigger uh, because it was uh, wood. There was a restriction uh, for, uh, for size. Um, and most importantly, they were not uh, created and printed for a community of Hebrew readers. This was meant um, for people who read English. In the following decades, we see more examples of single Hebrew words, Hebrew names of months, Hebrew proverbs incorporated within scripture books. Um, and this is um, the first book with uh, passages of Hebrew text. The text itself was uh, imported 
um, from Harvard, from uh, a benefactor of um, the Harvard College, um, that donated a complete set of, of metal type. And this book is a, is a Hebrew grammar book um, by Judah Munis, a convert to Christianity, who was the first instructor of uh, Hebrew in Harvard College. So again, this is a, a book not for a community of Hebrew speakers, but um, for students who um, learn Hebrew. Um, and then um, there is a gro uh, some growth of the Jewish American community, and um, they used to import the books they required from Europe. Um, but from the 1820 to 1924, uh, increasingly a steady flow of Jews made their way to America and a new market developed. So this is uh, one of the few first books uh, that we see by Isaac Lesser, and it's an English translation of Sephardic prayers from 1837. And Lesser is, um, he was a Jewish religious leader, teacher, scholar, and publisher, and he helped found the Jewish press of America. So we're getting closer to the users that uh, we um, um, intuitively would think of. Mass Jewish immigration from Europe started in the 1880s. This is a time where Jews, again, suffered oppressive laws that barred them from almost all means of providing for themselves, and they were physically segregated. A vast number of these Yiddish-speaking Jews managed to leave centuries-old legacy behind and flee to the US. And the print shops that opened in service of this growing Jewish communities represented a vibrant center of intense communal, religious, cultural, and literary life. So everything is, is going and growing. However, the shortage of typographic resources um, is still very much um, seen. I want to give you an example. Uh, we see here a photo of a hand-painted sign of the uh, Miller uh, printing shop. And I'm comparing it with uh, digitization of one of the typefaces uh, that we have in our collection. So notice the bottom horizontal strokes. They're all written in the same way, in the same direction. And that means that the in-stroke should look the same in each and every letter. Uh, and if we look closer, we see that the gimel has this angle, the pay has a similar angle, and the nun has this curve. Um, and when I look at it, um, I'm trying to find reasons for this inconsistency, and what comes to mind is, again, copying existing shape from an ephemeral resource, something that was lettered for a specific um, uh, reason, not necessarily thinking about the script as it performs uh, in a typeface. And then it's get, it gets worse, of course, because, again, resources are limited, and a printer maybe would need um, um, type blocks that they simply did not have. Let's flip this around so we can uh, look at it at the correct uh, direction. This is the letter Nun. This is the letter Gimel. And this is Nun made out of Gimel. So we know that this is a, a printing solution, you know, to find the, the very similar um, letters and kind of make them into another, um, not only in Hebrew, by the way, but this is something that, um, again, introduces inconsistency um, and, and very um, low quality, poor printing um, out, outcomes, or as I like to say, oy vey. <laughs> okay, so um, I think everybody understands that I'm a, I'm a quite of a history buff by now, and I'm, I'm very curious and kind of uh, eager to learn about this history. Um, but uh, whenever I, I am digging into these um, to these um, researches, um, I always ask myself, you know, at the end of the day, so what? So this is, this is very interesting, but what can I do with it at the end of the day as a Hebrew type designer? Um, what is the tachles, as we say in Hebrew and in Yiddish, uh, which is the, the word for essence? Uh, what is, what is the, the baseline? Um, and today I want to um, offer three thoughts um, of ways to easily expand contemporary Hebrew type designs. Um, I'm not uh, talking about uh, designing secondary styles. It's not going to be complica complicated at all. I hope you'll, um, um, you'll bear with me and I'll be able to convince you. So uh, the first issue is language coverage. In recent years, there is a lot of energy around uh, the Yiddish language and 
culture, specifically in the US. So much so that next month um, there is a discussion that I'm really looking forward to listen to um, in the Institute for Jewish Research in New York that is asking, are we currently experiencing a Yiddish renaissance? And let me show you why they're asking this question. So this is uh, from 2018, an extremely successful theater production of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. The whole play was in Yiddish, and uh, it was super um, successful by audiences that not necessarily knew the language. Two Netflix TV dramas that are in Yiddish. The Forward Online Daily Forward that introduces now a Yiddish wordle. <coughs> and um, a very significant uh, addition to uh, the Duolingo language learning app. So you can learn Yiddish now um, on your phone. So there is a growing number of new users for the Yiddish language that uses the Hebrew script. So I want to give you an example of, of this experience that I'm going through as a, a, a new learner of the Yiddish, um, the, the Yiddish language. So for example, if I uh, go in on the Duolingo's website and I want to read about it, this is what I see. So for the English, we have um, Din Next Rounded. We have uh, the... Um, benefit of a secondary style in italic, so, so far so good. And when we um, read the Yiddish, we have two different fallback fonts um, that are, again, very problematic as in of themselves and definitely when they are typeset with the English. And th this is why it's important for me to share this information because if you have designed a Hebrew typeface, this is all that you have to do in order to cover the Yiddish language. And these are not new characters. They're uh, characters that you've already designed. You just need to combine them uh, together um, very, very fast. And, and why not? Um, why would you uh, wait for a client to request it specifically? Why not go ahead and do that and offer this language support for, uh, for a community of a different and kind of um, um, a reviving um, language? And moreover, the typographic resources for research into Yiddish uh, printed material are growing. Uh, this is an amazing example. The Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, offer a digital Yiddish library that has more than 11,000 Yiddish titles, all available to read online or download for free. Um, and also, they continuously upload uh, images of book covers that show very diverse letterings um, and really express this um, uh, this range of, of emotions uh, in, in Yiddish. This is something that at least I did not see uh, for uh, Hebrew publications. And I also hear that they have an amazing uh, TikTok. I'm too old for that, but um, um, it, it, it was recommended. So you can check it out for yourself. Um, the second point um, is defect turn into, into default. And bear with me. Um, I promise to explain everything. So out of the 27 Hebrew letters that are squarish in shapes, right, all caps, um, in air quotes, uh, and with very, um, um, a lot of problem of differentiation, we have um, only six letters that have descenders. But um, these are f most of them are final letters, which means that they are alternative characters that are used only uh, when they appear at the end of the word. And if we look at um, high-frequency letters, we have only two that have those you know, um, um, wonderful, valuable assets of a descender that really helps with letter differentiation. Um, but the descender of the letter I'm has disappeared over the years, uh, mostly in the monolinear styles that are uh, used as an equivalent to the Latin sans serif. They're all uh, on the baseline, nothing decent. And I think I might be able to offer an insight into that um, because of the fact that I've been uh, working so closely with those uh, wood blocks and seeing what happens when you, when you work with them so intensely. 
So I noticed that many of the letters that we have um, are broken, their descenders are broken. So you can see this is the ayn with the descender in its full form. Um, and these two ayns uh, were just broken due to the process of printing. So this is the, um, the side angle and you can see that there is um, a space. That's how the block was created uh, in order to allow easier and faster spacing. But it also means, meant that the printer had to uh, make sure that that uh, space, if it wasn't uh, supported by a, um, a line, needed special attention. And mostly that did not happen, and so that part of the block would break under the press. And then um, I've noticed that that corner, that bottom left corner, sometimes was, was uh, filed in order to refine um, um, the, the type, the outcome. And this, you can see it completely alters um, the shape of this letter. And now it gets really heartbreaking because these are typefaces um, that were cut in this way. So this is the design with this rectangular shape that makes absolutely no sense uh, for someone who is familiar with how this letter is, is written. And it continues. And then I'm finding it in metal typefaces as well. Um, so th this is um, um, a typeface from 1939. And just to, to show you again the comparison of the, it's a linotype uh, typeface. So we have on the one side the letter Ein uh, with its ductus, and on the, red, on the other side how it was later on um, created. And I think that this uh, poorly designed shape uh, offered another very um, useful solution when Hebrew uh, was set with vowel marks, so a diacritical uh, marks of system that sometimes needed to use the lower part of the eye. So after I kind of discovered this descender that, that disappeared, I'm kind of asking, why not create a letter alternative? We have the Unicode. It's kind of how you would approach the design of this letter in any way. Why not uh, just produce another glyph? It's digital. It, comparatively, it's a very easy, again, and short process. Um, and on the topic of letter alternatives, um, another thing that I noticed had to do with the only A sender that we have in the Hebrew language. This is the Lamed. And when I looked at different um, variation of this character within the same sets of type, I noticed there are many um, alternative for this design. So this is the kind of most contemporary, the most familiar shape of the Lamed, and you can see it's also in this case the most fragile. You can see it's kind of barely holding, in, holding up. Um, I see here a very good solution of ex just l the taking that um, stroke and pulling it backwards to shorten the block and prevent it from breaking. And this is, again, a, a very common solution that we see in, now in typefaces, which is just to shorten that um, ascender. And again, this is something that is a really great tool for letter differentiation. So if we can help the readers distinguish between the letters, um, we would tend to want uh, more ascenders. And then I was able to find um, the patterns that were used to cut the wood type. These are uh, from the Hamilton Wood Type Museum in Wisconsin. Um, and a pattern would be, used, would be put into a pantograph machine and traced with an air power router. And if you're fascinated um, by type production uh, like I am and you've enjoyed uh, Doug Wilson's uh, wonderful films, I strongly recommend to go to the Hamilton Wood Type Museum and look at this um, live demo of the pantograph. It's, it's fascinating. So what I'm seeing here um, are existing type variations, two alternatives for the Lamed, and uh, the last point for today, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, is um, the white letters. So white letters are a calligraphic solution that biblical scribes have developed as a solution for block alignment since hyphenation is not allowed. You cannot break a Hebrew word. So, uh, and this is a, an example from an incunabula uh, script. You can see we have two versions of the Lamed and one of them 
um, is just wider, um, and there are more letters um, like this. And again, we have um, we have um, the Unicodes for this, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot because. Um, Oops, sorry. The fact that that typographic tool did not survive uh, um, the different technologies over time had nothing to do with its typographic qualities. It was mostly external uh, reasons. So these um, extra variations for the letters were omitted during different uh, production processes. And once you know it and you see it, and it's, again, very uh, easy to digitally uh, produce it, why not add it to your character set? Again, technically, very, very easy. And if you do that, and this is a wonderful example that I found, why not make it a variable font? I really like this kind of um, connection between um, history and contemporary tools um, that are really um, you know, connecting in a really, way, in a really good way and in, for the benefit of the users. So, um, I'm, I just want to, uh, to um, conclude um, and maybe think about reintroducing uh, historical forms uh, in, to expand this effort to enrich our uh, the Hebrew typographic vocabulary and cultural experience. Thank you. <laughs>